Today, I'll talk about how to run an efficient transit system. Perfect! Oh, um, I mean, yay. Ever had your train arrive late? And overcrowded too? Why should I bother catching the bus? They're so infrequent. Why can't I rely on public transport? Yeah, why should I even bother? They're never even reliable in the first place. If you provide a decent transit system, however, it gives people more choices how they want to travel. Mass transit can also be very compact and very efficient, making it very cost effective in tackling congestion. Although transit can only be achieved successfully with maximum benefit if it was ran efficiently and effectively. This is why some transit systems fail to attract passengers. Poor choices can be made when transport decisions are made by politicians instead of the community. And engineers, everyone needs to be involved. So what makes a successful transit system? The most important feature to a transit system is having a high frequency of service. High frequency transportation is really important to track passengers to use the system. This is because it gives them more certainty that the service is running. Another benefit is, if you miss your service, you don't need to stress about waiting for the next one. By pushing the frequency of services, it means interchanging between different modes of transit is seamless. Generally, the most time you waste catching public transport is waiting for the service to arrive. Having frequent services reduces the waiting time in your journey, making it more competitive to driving. As long as it links to jobs and residential areas together, increasing the service will guarantee more patronage into the transit system. It gives people more choices as the service is turn up and go, making the transit option very convenient. What you need to be aware of is that the tolerance for frequency varies with trip distance. A 15 minute wait for one hour journey will feel different to a 15 minute wait to a three minute journey. So we generally aim for higher frequencies when we're aiming for shorter trips. However, frequency can be very expensive. So often it's only affordable when the capacity is required. Sometimes there are infrastructure constraints that make it difficult to provide a high frequency of service. These constraints can be helped by upgrading the infrastructure from removing grade junctions, better signaling, reducing the single track sections, more rolling stock, and reduce sharing long sections of track between different services. If these constraints are preventing the frequency to enable people to use the service, then upgrading the infrastructure needs to happen prior to increasing the services. Improving the signaling system can allow much more trains to run on a section of line without the need to add extra tracks. Removing branches on the transport network by making line-to-line -line connections can significantly increase the amount of vehicles that can run on the route. By adding capacity, delays would significantly reduce and allow for higher frequencies and reduced travel times. Although, infrastructure upgrades can be very expensive to construct and implement into the transit system. In some cases, frequency can be improved without much modification to the existing network. It just needs funding to run the extra services. If the patronage is showing some strong growth and the infrastructure can handle it, having services every 10 minutes every day of the week is essential. This would reduce overcrowding and make the service more reliable for people to use. The cost of travel is important as this can affect the patronage and how much the transit recovers its cost of running the service. Is your service affordable? Most likely it is. If the transit network is overcharging passengers, this can reduce the demand of the service to the point where it recovers much less than operation than if it was a lower price with more patronage. An example from Toronto 
when they opened their fast airport to downtown transit line. The end-to-end -end fare on opening day was $27.90 in Canadian dollars, about eight times the subway and bus fare. As a result, the ridership was embarrassingly low. In early 2016, in response to growing pressure, they slashed the fare to $12.35. The ridership improved almost immediately. Other cities are looking at ways to create transit that should also take Toronto's lesson into account, particularly when it comes to fares. So that's the issue running services at a premium cost, is that it becomes too expensive to the everyday commuter and the patronage is so low it barely recovers the cost of running the service. Although having a really cheap fare while supports a higher patronage than usual would mean a lack of incentive to keep maintaining and funding the network, it barely recovers the cost of running the service. That is why free public transport doesn't work. Having this perfect balance that keeps the passengers happy while it gives incentive to improve the service is essential for the transit system to operate efficiently. This is why setting the cost of the fare for travel is really important. When you're trying to get from point A to point B, you might have to interchange with another service. From getting a bus to getting a train. Seamless connection is convenient because it significantly reduces the waiting time in your commute. Connecting the different services together benefits mostly to infrequent routes as it would be highly inconvenienced waiting for the next service. There are many transport routes that could benefit with better timetabling to connect better with different services. Although delays to each type of transit can vary and this can be very frustrating when your seamless connection didn't work out. This is why the frequency of services are so important. This is because if the service is so frequent, you never have to wait for a very long time waiting between the services and every service will match up within minutes. Another key thing in transit is walking. It's another important feature that you see in cities. It doesn't just improve the accessibility of transit, it has social and community benefits. Improving areas to walk around means people are healthier and not driving short distances. Making it easier to walk to a transit stop is important as it encourages people to use different modes of public transport without needing the car. A compact neighborhood that reduces reliance on the car and promotes walking generally has relatively high densities, mixed land uses and a well-connected street network. These components allow for jobs, schools, transit and other important services to be located close together and closer to where people live. To keep the transit network in a good shape for the future, good maintenance and planning is essential. Maintenance involves keeping the rolling stock, signalling, track and road infrastructure up to date. Planning for the future involves developing the right areas of land preserving and planning for transit corridors and have some consistency as well. Good future planning means money can be saved in the future, gives direction and vision on how the transport network can operate in the future. It will also mean that infrastructure does not need to be ripped up every time because the planning will involve provision for future projects to happen without largely impacting the newly placed infrastructure. So let's say you're on a service that's frequent, but you find yourself taking forever to your destination. The time taken for your journey should be consistent and not take forever. Majority of these issues relate to the journey time, either lacking of capacity on the network or a lack of priority. To reduce delays on the frequent transit routes that share space on the roads, priority should be given on these modes of transit. It speeds up the travel time which makes it a more viable way to travel. Sometimes it can be tricky to prioritize space for transit routes on narrow road corridors, which means it's best to remove street parking. A very well known example is Melbourne's tram and streetcar network. While it's frequent, 75% of the network is shared with other traffic on Melbourne's roads, and this presents a challenge in terms of congestion. The lack of priority from car vehicles provides the tram network with unreliable journey times during peak traffic which makes our trams the slowest in the world. 
trying to bring tram routes running in narrow corridors up to notional LRT standard is problematic because if the effects of such upgrades would impact the fabric of the urban areas. And it also may cost many billions of dollars as well. Although with major improvements, it could drastically improve the experience for those who use the tram network. Due to this congestion with the tram network, a majority of commuters support this transformation, with a recent poll in the Melbourne newspaper finding that 62% of readers favouring increased priority for trams over cars. So now we've looked at why your bus didn't arrive on time and why your commute is taking longer than usual. Yes, we've shown that if you provide a decent transit system, it gives people more choices on how they want to travel. Using effective modes of transit can tackle congestion in cities. This can be achieved successfully by having high frequencies, good accessibility, prioritizing lanes, and good planning. So now you know what makes a successful, efficient transit network. Thank you for watching the video. Yay! You haven't uploaded in three months? What's wrong with you? Sorry about the delays. I'll explain it in the next update video, which will come out very soon. Editing takes... Oh.